Welcome to GPS, God's Prophetic Surprises. We're here again with another Zoom session, and uh, we have a new panelist today, and uh, his name is Michael Kelly, and uh, he is the uh, pastor of the Mount Rubido Church in Riverside, California. Thrilled to death to have you with us, Michael. And we welcome back Nick Snell uh, once again, who is a uh, pastor at the uh, Loma Linda University Church. And we welcome, all, as always, Viana Chambers, and she is a pastor at Calamesa Seventh-day Adventist Church. By the way, Nick is from Azure Hills. Yeah, Loma oh, Linda well. University is a great church, but I'm in Azure well. Hills. <laughs> Okay, I stand corrected. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's get that right. Uh, absolutely great to, to have that. As you know, there are some faces that are missing. Uh, it is in the summer, and a couple of the folk, uh, Philip and Guilherme, are doing some work on their doctoral dissertations, and we don't want to, uh, to keep them from that. And I believe Shifra is, is on vacation. But uh, they'll be back with us in the future. And uh, as I said, we welcome uh, Michael once again. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yeah, you know, again, it's an honor really to be here, uh, to be with this great panel, uh, you know, from actually originally from uh, Southern California. Uh, you know, Dr. Pauline uh, was actually one of my professors in seminary. So if anyone here does not agree with anything I say, uh, go directly to him because everything I know about this book and everything is from Dr. Pauline. <laughs> I'm teasing, uh, but no, uh, yeah, he, was, he was one of my favorite room. students, and uh, so uh, yeah, definitely anything he says wrong is my fault. So go ahead and follow <laughs> that instruction. I've <laughs> uh, been at my church for 11 years now, so awesome, very good. Uh, and Michael, uh, you know these are these have been some challenging times, and. Uh, uh, however long it may be uh, that this uh, program continues uh, on LLBN, uh, people will remember uh, when they see these Zoom screens that this is not the typical uh, production from LLBN. So uh, we are still in the COVID-19 season. And <clears throat> I was wondering if you could share with us, Michael, how COVID-19 is affecting your congregation and uh, perhaps in a larger sense, the African-American community in North America. Yeah, um, you know, for us, because of the division and the way that we went about doing church in general, um, when COVID hit, going digital was a very easy switch for us. Um, the thing, though, for us now is really just how to make digital disciples, you know, because we don't want people to just turn into viewers, but we want them to really be engaged even in this digital space and still understand that just in the midst of a pandemic doesn't mean God doesn't call us to less. But I think this pandemic has actually stretched us, exposed some of the inadequacies that we have as a church and God's way of saying, no, this is what I really want church to look like. I never intended for it to be simply confined to a building. Uh, so let's stretch. So that's what we've really been doing, stretching. You know, we've been serving about 350 families every single Saturday, you know, with groceries. Um, and so that's been really just an awesome way for us to continue to be the hands and feet of Jesus. Um, as far as, you know, how COVID has affected the African-American community, I think what it's done is it's really exposed different disparities within other areas of the community um, with our health disparities, um, in some cases, education, home ownership, as well as overall wealth. Um, and it's brought national attention to that. And so we as a church, I uh, have just tried to continue to build up communities by closing those gaps and moving statistics. Oh, appreciate that uh, very much. Uh, I think we all want to care uh, very much about each other and to to hear directly from you. Uh, that is encouraging. And, and it's kind of neat. You, you said that, that maybe COVID exposed some things that weren't going as well in the church. Uh, you want to say something about that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, particularly for us as Christian Seventh-day Adventists, um, the Sabbath, Saturday, the day we go to church has become such a big thing, and particularly going to church in this building. And I think we've lost sight of, you know, what does Paul say? Uh, you are the temple of which the Holy Spirit dwells. And, you know, we really are the church. And so now I think what COVID showed is that we were too attached to this building that we as individuals have forgotten that we are God's church, we are his ambassadors, his representatives. And COVID has forced us into that place because now you can't invite people to a building 
uh, and you can't just simply invite them to watch on Zoom or whatever platform it is. Now I think we really have to interact, you know, live out ministry appealing page 143 in, in, in an even more intentional way. So awesome. Amen. Yeah, very, love very that. good. I, I love that testimony. Um, as I was thinking about it, the, the purpose for the church is spelled out in Matthew 28, and that's to make disciples. And you don't make disciples with mass media. You make disciples one-on-one. -on -one. And so I, I, I picked up on that point that searching for ways to really personalize uh, distance learning. Uh, I'm facing that right now. I'm doing a, an online course for nursing uh, in uh, Adventist beliefs. And the vast majority of the students will not be from the Seventh-day Adventist tradition. And so I'm really wrestling with how can you turn an online experience into a real one-on-one, -on -one, uh, a real engagement uh, with people's spiritual life and so forth. Um, I'm wondering if uh, Nick or Viana has any, any thoughts in response to what you've heard? Yeah, um, I, for, for me as a youth pastor, um, we're trying to be safe and uh, we're not doing everything online. We're trying to do some things in person as safe as possible with masks and screening and distancing and everything. Um, so even though we can't meet as a large group, there's no reason that we can't meet in a safe way in smaller groups. And uh, obviously, um, Pastor Michael is taking groceries to people, his church members are. So you have some interaction there. There's a way to do it safely to interact, to serve and, and come close to people. Um, so I, I think we just, it's a time for creativity. And I, I love that this time is actually stretching us to focus on the things that matter most. I've kind of called this introvert's paradise, you know, in a real sense, you get, you get a chance to, uh, to have some quiet time. Viana, you've been a train conductor lately. Do I say something about that? Yeah, I can speak for several children's ministry uh, in different churches. We've been doing our vacation Bible school, and we have had the train theme for the most part. Um, and that has been a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that I've noticed, as uh, Michael pointed out, and so did Nick, um, is that there were a lot of leaders who were so afraid of fading out and becoming irrelevant in the church. So they were really stacking a lot of programs and effort to to stay relevant and, and and while i admire that connection that they were making i had to like really ask the question like what is your intention behind wanting to you know to stay in the faces of these children and even vacation bible school was i had to step back and say god what do you want me to do what's your purpose for vacation bible school and although i wasn't very clear on that vision i decided to go ahead with it anyway and at the end of it, I got so many testimonies back from these children, these families, and saying, hey, this was this was a program that really helped me do hard things, right? It was one of the themes for the week. Uh, Jesus' power pulls us through. And I couldn't imagine like having a more fitting topic for this summer with our kids and our families. So there's been a lot of growth for sure. And I'm just grateful that we could provide that for our families. Mm, awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, delighted to be able to see that uh, from the side uh, there in Calamesa Church. Uh, Nick, why don't you uh, lead us into Revelation 12? And uh, when we left off, we were looking at verses 6 and 14. Uh, 13 and 14 or 6 and 14? 6 and 14. Yeah, we were comparing those two because oh, okay. they're both texts. Yeah. You want me to read? Okay, I'll read both. Back yeah. to back. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm reading from the New King James Version. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. And its counterpart in 1214. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time from the presence of the serpent. All right, so take a look at those two verses. And the question I have for you, uh, we, we looked at the similarities. You know, you have a woman, you have the desert, you've got feeding, uh, you got a time period. What's different between these two? 
I guess the way they refer to the time, one is very, very specific on the 1,260 days. The other one mentions the time, times, and half a time. Okay. And why would John do that? Why would he, why would he just use a term like days and then suddenly come up with this weird thing, time, times, and half a time? It almost sounds like... like a a forced connection. Like I want you to see the similarities of these two verses and know that different words can mean the same thing. Um, it may be pushing an agenda. I'm curious. Okay. So he's, he must have a purpose here. And one thing might be 1260 days. If time is one year and times are two years and half a time, three and a half years is about 1260 days. So it might one way it might be just say here sees two different ways of saying the same thing. But in Daniel chapter seven, there's a time period, time times and half a time. And so John here is alluding to the Old Testament. One of the real big stories about Revelation is how uh, the author uses the Old Testament in order to um, unpack what he's saying in greater detail. Uh, it brings flesh to the whole thing. It expands the idea. You can say a whole lot with a few things if you point back to the Old Testament and, and people draw that in to the text. So an allusion to the Old Testament seems obvious in verse 14 with the time, times, and half a time. Anything else between the two verses that stands out as different? One difference I see is in... Uh, <coughs> 12, 14, the way the woman goes into the wilderness is with wings, right? She flies into the wilderness. In uh, verse 6, it just says she fled, so maybe ran, or I don't know. Okay. Up there a different way. No, I think it's a good observation, and, and, and going along with that is that in uh, verse 6, it's active, the fleeing. She flees. Hmm. In verse 14, it's passive. She's given wings mm -hmm. that carry her into the desert. So you have this active, passive thing going. Mm -hmm. but one more thing that you might not notice in English that just popped into my vision when I was looking at the Greek uh, just a couple of days ago is that it says um, in verse 6, it says they fed her. They fed her. Who's the they? Who, you know, I, it says the woman flees into the desert where she has a place prepared by God and they nourished her 1260 days. What would, what would you think that might be about? I mean, it, there, there's no reference. You have a dragon, you have a woman, you have a male child. There's no they there why would he say they fed her hmm. they had a hunch is there any place in the old testament where they feed somebody out in the desert for three and a half years the birds that elijah the birds that's right ravens we got them in our back so often. Yeah. yeah the ravens came to feed elijah so it's just odd that in, in verse 14, it's just a passive. She was nourished there. Uh, but uh, in, in verse 6, they nourish her. They feed her. Uh, I can't come up with anything better. It seems to me probably that's a reference to Elijah and uh, how when he was out in the desert for three and a half years, uh, ravens came and, and brought him food. So which, there's which, some subtle which, stuff here. Yeah. yeah. So, so why the ravens is my question. What What do we need to know about that? Just God provision in miraculous ways. Yeah, I'm just curious to know what that has to do with um, what this represents. Sound like a skeptic to me. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you right now. I'm just saying I I can't come up with any other explanation. It may prove to have significance down the line, but I I think it's really Revelation calls us to pay attention to every possible detail, and maybe it'll make sense and maybe it won't. For example, uh, Armageddon, uh, when you connect that with Megiddo, 
the mountain of Megiddo, there is no mountain at Megiddo. So it's just an odd, weird thing until if you know the geography, I remember one time standing in ancient Megiddo, the ruins of ancient Megiddo, and there was a mountain there, a really impressive one. It was really big. And I said, what's, what's that mountain? I said, Mount Carmel. <clears throat> ding, ding, ding. Suddenly things started coming together. Hmm. The mountain of Megiddo is Mount Carmel. And Elijah had something to do with Mount Carmel. You know? hmm. So suddenly, fire down from heaven, Revelation 13, mountain of Megiddo, chapter 16. Some things started coming together. Hmm. At the end of time, there'll be a showdown between two God systems. Hmm. And there'll be a showdown between two Gospels. And it'll be decided by fire from heaven, except... On this one, the fire will fall on the wrong altar. We'll get we'll get to that when we get to chapter thirteen. <laughs> All right. But just you know, yeah, yeah. I want to point out that like while the raven feeding Elijah is a very physical provision, I'm not sure that's what this verse is referring to. Maybe it is. Is the provision given to the woman, which is God's people, um, is is that physical? Like, is is birds? bringing down food necessary for us to understand what the nourishment looks like for God's people while they're being persecuted by mm. serpent. So, so Viana's throwing out the idea, is this again literal feeding or is it something else? And that's where yeah. birds can, can, you know, like Nick said, maybe it's not relevant to know how birds are nourishing the, God's people at the end of time. <laughs> I didn't say it wasn't relevant. I just want to know what it means. <laughs> I, I think I think sometimes, you know, when you look at your know, revelation, you know, obviously the book makes it very clear. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ and, you know, apocalypse, you know, the times of the end. So really the book about how is Jesus Christ taking his people through the end. And I think when we look at this particular text, even without understanding maybe the exact nuance I think the principle is clear that there is, when you look at verse six, it says very clear, this place prepared. Then verse 14, nourishing. And so we see that what I think we, we can really take away as far as like a, a modern day application is that God is prepared, you know, to nourish us during those difficult, you know, times that he's going to create, whether it's going to be sending ravens or whatever it is that we are going to be provided for during this, you know, this time period. Yeah, I love that. God is still Jehovah Jireh, the God that provides. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And Viana will remember that several programs ago, when we were looking at the war in heaven, we discovered a number of evidences that this is not a literal war. It, it uses the language of war, the language of fighting, the language of battle. Nevertheless, uh, there were a bunch of references that made it clear First of all, on one side is the ancient serpent. Well, that throws you back to the Garden of Eden where he's telling lies about God. In verse 10, he's the accuser of the brothers. He's cast out, not as a defeated general, he's cast out as the accuser of the brothers. And then in verse 11, they overcame him by the word of their testimony. And then you discover the tale of the dragon way back in verse four, that he, he drew stars out of heaven, that tale represented lying prophets in the Old Testament. So we found a bunch of evidence that this is not a literal war, a literal battle. And so I think your point is very well taken, Viana, uh, that this is a spiritual nourishment, that maybe at a time when spiritual food is not very abundant, God will provide for those who are willing to learn. Those who are willing to receive. As Jesus, I think, said, uh, if you're willing uh, to be made willing, you will know uh, what God has in mind. So the book of Revelation invites us to know God, to know his revelation. Uh, but in order for that to happen, we need to be open to it. All right. Well, when we get to verse 6 and 14, we see 1,260 days. Time, times, and half a time. Uh, what have Seventh-day Adventists in the past done with those time periods? What have you done with those time periods? <laughs> uh, preaching or your evangelism? Or... 
Uh, um, you know, it, it, for me, it's always been based on who my audience is, um, because I think sometimes some people can get really lost uh, in the numbers and I think miss the, you know, the overall and big principles. So, of course, if you're preaching primarily to Adventist crowd, you know, they want to understand, you know, year, day and understand those principles. But then there's some other folks when you're doing your evangelistic effort. Well, it's like, man, well, let me just share you what this really is about Christ and Jesus. So I think for me personally, it's always been based on my audience because some people, I think, honestly, if we, if we just be frank, sometimes they get, you know, the, the direct application for them just gets lost in defining that principle that's being uh, explained here in uh, Revelation and also in Daniel. Okay. The honor, Nick. I think there, there is this real sense of loss when it comes to interpreting revelation. So one of the things that I've fallen back on, which is kind of easy to do, is falling back on the research and on the backs of people who have come before me and in, try to interpret revelation. So when I see the time, times and a half, and, and I see that the days, I people have told me, hey, that l translates into, you know, years and different things. And so I just say, oh, great, thank you, because now I don't have to do my homework. I can just go from where you left off and take off from there. And obviously we can be blindsided by a couple of, or miss or have gaps in, in some of our teachings if we don't do our own homework. Okay, so you, you understand that, uh, that people have taken these days as years. And so this is the period of 1260 years, uh, generally spanning the Middle Ages and, uh, and a little bit on both sides of it uh, as well. Um, how do you think people got to such an idea? I mean, it doesn't say years. Why interpret it that way? I think people need something solid to hold on to when it comes to revelation. So they will dig deep, try to find a connection, maybe in the Old Testament, like Daniel, um, and say, there it is. Like, we, we have an answer. Now we can move forward. It's so hard to uh, just kind of float around with no answers or ambiguity. So trying to find anything that kind of fits into this. And I, Daniel um, is a good starting point for some people. Yeah, and I would say that as we're doing... Uh, just a moment ago with Elijah and the ravens and getting that from the word they and, and all that. Like, it's not a bad thing, of course, to go to the Old Testament, to go to Daniel. It seems like, you know, John is intentionally uh, making that connection. So that's the closest connection that I can think of in the whole Bible um, to relate to this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I do uh, a lot of uh, baptismal studies as a youth pastor and try to go through, you know, the Adventist beliefs uh, with them and uh, make sure that Jesus is front and center in all of it. Um, and doing a study on um, the prophetic year, day principle, all that stuff and how it for us as Adventists lands in 1844 and everything like that. Um, they're kind of like, well, what does that actually change that um, that Jesus moved from the holy place to the most holy place? And um, the thing that I found myself sharing with them, uh, at least in my most recent set of studies, was that um, it just shows if we're thinking of, of, you know, the day of atonement, there's a lot of things that it's like so hard to refer to everything in this moment. Um, to make sense of this if people aren't familiar with it. Um, but it, for me, it just goes to like, we're really close to the end and close to Jesus uh, coming back and things are wrapping up. And so there's a sense of urgency uh, to this. And um, if we are thinking about the Day of Atonement, it was a day of, of making sure that um, you kind of got your priorities in order. So that's kind of where I went with it. We kind of have three generations here, I think, uh, with us. And um, your generation, I take it, Viana and Nick, uh, similar uh, age level there. It sounds to me like what is, is that your generation is not really seeing a lot of value here. Uh, and yet it was critical to the early Adventists. 
I mean, nailing down the time was critical. If they hadn't been specific on that, Adventists wouldn't be here. This is really, really critical. So here's the interesting thing. I think often we feel like they were driven by the Bible to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's made people very uncomfortable because mm -hmm. where in the Bible is the year day principle? Right. It is not stated anywhere. If the year day principle is that whenever in prophecy you see a day interpreted as a year, that principle isn't in the Bible. Mm -hmm. There's nowhere. There's a couple of verses that people point to, but they're not prophetic verses in, in the sense that they're not talking about broad principles. So the question is, how did it come up? And here's the interesting thing. You've all heard of Leroy Froome. He mm -hmm. uh, wrote a series. He's a researcher, he wrote a series of books on the prophetic heritage uh, of, of the early church. And, and he studied the whole 2000 years from from Jesus' time until, until his day, and uh, went to the Library of Congress for like 10 years or something. He just dug up all this stuff. It was amazing. But I decided to, to dig out from his four volumes, like 4,000 pages, all the references to the year-day principle. Mm -hmm. And you know what I discovered? It wasn't ever driven by the Bible. The first time it really appears is in uh, the first century, Jesus' day, when they're talking about Daniel 9. When they're about 500 years from Daniel, and then suddenly they start saying, well, if these 70 you know, weeks represent years, then maybe Messiah is about to come. And so you had the Jews saying, Messiah is about to come because we're 490 years from this decree. So uh, it was driven by history. Then around 1200 AD, some people are saying, well, time has gone longer than we thought, but if these 1260 days are years, then maybe Jesus is coming in 1260, you mm -hmm. see? And the same kind of thing happened with 1844, the 2300 day prophecy. Nobody really knew what to do with it, but as you got to about 2,300 years from the time of Daniel, people said, well, maybe this is years, and maybe we can figure something out. Does that make it wrong? Uh, I, 45 I, seconds. Does that make it wrong? Oh, yes. I, 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 there's a part of me that definitely would say, says yes, because I, I, I don't like for us to take things to make them fit um, that aren't hermeneutically uh, you know, sound and exegetically sound, because I think when people in different generations discover that, then they try to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And I think that's even what's happened with the 2300 day prophecy. I literally had somebody leave my church in Adventism because they didn't think the numbers lined up exactly. Yeah. Okay. So this is a challenge and we will take that challenge up in our very next program to, to talk about how do we connect what made so much sense then with what people struggle with today. God's prophetic surprise for today and this program. See you again next time.